So let's talk a little bit about space junk and space traffic, which is the next wicked problem that we as a society face. I'm an astrodynamicist, which means that I study the motion of objects in space, and no, we all don't wear what I'm wearing right now. <laughs> so interestingly enough, you know, from the dawn of the space age, it all started with one single satellite, which was Sputnik, and it was an object of one, and we had this space race, and it was the US versus the Soviet Union, and the interesting thing is, we have a lot of objects in space. It's not just a couple. It's not just a few countries. It's lots of countries, lots of objects. And unfortunately, there's a big problem with all these objects. That kind of impending doom of sorts, but uh, rest assured, your lives aren't in danger yet. But uh, our way of life is certainly something that could be threatened. Because all of us depend on space services and capabilities. All of us have this cool little cell phone. I definitely use it. Uh, I don't remember the last time I actually pulled out a map to go from point A to point B. I have this nice dot that tells me turn left in 500 feet, that sort of thing. All of us are accustomed to watching TV and seeing our favorite sports channels. Sometimes the weather, the hurricane that just happened, right, we had a lot of warning that this was happening. It wasn't like all of a sudden this hit without any sort of uh, a notice. We actually knew when this is happening, where it's going. So all of these things depend on space services and capabilities. It's very important stuff. So what am I talking about here when I talk about all this traffic in space? So here we go. So this is a nice little video from NASA's Orbital Debris Program Office at Johnson Space Center in Houston. And interestingly enough, the US Department of Defense maintains a catalog of 22,000 things the size of a softball enlarger, size of this cell phone enlarger, 22,000 things. And out of those 22,000 things, only about 1,400 of those things work, and everything else is garbage. Everything else is garbage. And the thing is, most of that stuff, it doesn't come back. It just stays up there in perpetuity. It's just orbiting around. And the thing is, even something as small as a coin hitting you at a very fast, fast speed could all of a sudden disable your satellite, disable your mission. GPS could be disabled by debris. That could happen. And so things in sufficiently low Earth orbit, those things kind of re-enter. In fact, uh, on average, about one to three objects per day re-enter and burns up in the atmosphere. Some of them survive, which uh, is kind of scary to think about. Thankfully, most of the planet's covered by ocean, so most of that comes into the ocean. But most of that stuff, stays up there. And the thing is, even if we didn't launch anything else, that population is self-growing because on average, every two to five years, things collide with each other and they become more and more objects. So it's a thing, it's not so good, it's kind of a problem, and whose problem is it? Who has the responsibility? And we're gonna talk a little bit about that moving forward. So, space is kind of like the Wild West in many respects. And, and, and why do I say that? I say that because there's this kind of lawlessness. There's no kind of rule of law governing what happens in space necessarily. Um, it's kind of like the Wild West that way. By the way, uh, there's a lot of money that's being had from space services and capabilities. It's not just communications, but I've talked to venture capitalists and angel investors, and it's that kind of What's the quick uh, return on my investment? How can I put something on orbit and I hear things like uh, pixels for dollars? People want to have information on tap. We heard earlier about how we have so much information these days and how that is just doubling and quadrupling in size uh, on a daily basis kind of thing. And so there's a lot of information that is out there to be had and people have noticed that. And by the way, being able to have things that look down, people want to have live stream video of what's going on on the surface of the planet 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the time. So can you imagine just having on your cell phone seeing who went to the grocery store, who didn't? I mean, we talked about privacy earlier. I'm telling you, that's out of the window. With these constellations of satellites going up and just collecting all this data and selling it to the highest bidder, um, I, I'm afraid that maybe you know, privacy is uh, something that uh, needs to be re-looked at, right? Also, the price of going to space, that's becoming cheaper. 
And with cheaper access to space, it's kind of like the transcontinental railroad, which connected the East Coast to the West Coast. I mean, once this happened, businesses just started thriving, businesses boomed. But with the cost of getting the space becoming cheaper, more and more people are just putting stuff up there, but there's not a whole lot of regard to pollution. And so back in the mining days, you know, you had uh, mercury deposits, you had silt in the water, that sort of stuff. It's not like there was the EPA back in, in those days in the Wild West. And guess what? There's no EPA for space. There are people who care about it, but there's no kind of enforceable mechanism to do any of this stuff. 22,000 things orbiting. By the way, um, the 22,000 things, there's actually more stuff. And the 22,000 things are only the number of objects that we're actually tracking. So we're facing what I call the tragedy of the commons. And what is that? Well, turns out that there's this guy in 1833, William Foster Lloyd, who posited that when you have a shared resource, a common resource with multiple players, and all those players are acting independently and in self-interest, that they tend to behave contrary to the benefit of the whole. All right, lots of words, Marie, but what does that kind of mean? Well, let's assume that we're all cattle grazers, cattle herders. Um, not that I would like to do that, but let's just for the sake of argument say we're all, uh, you know, cattle herders, and we had this common plot of land, and for each head of cattle, right, we get paid more. More profit, more heads of cattle. But at some point, if any one of us has too many cattle, then there's overgrazing, and then it hurts everybody. That's kind of the direction that we're going on in space, is that we have more and more participants, more and more actors. We started off with Sputnik, and now, from a, just a couple of countries, now we have, I think the United Nations recognizes well over 60 countries participating in space. So it's not just a couple. Now it's like 60 of them. Tragedy of the commons. We don't want that to happen. So here's this interesting plot, and I'm not going to ask the people at the top row to read this, but what I want to tell you is the following. Remember I showed you that video, 22,000 things buzzing around the planet? So. There's this interesting sensor developed by the US government through DARPA and MIT Lincoln Laboratory that sits in New Mexico, not too far away from uh, where my family actually lives. And it's a really cool sensor because the good news about Space Surveillance Telescope is that it detects lots of stuff. The bad news about the Space Surveillance Telescope is that it detects lots of stuff. And so basically what you see behind me is you see a bunch of dots. All of those dots are detections. It's what the sensor detected on one night, one night of detections of things in space. The dots that are black are things that we know what they are. The dots that are not black, who knows? We have no idea which dot of those could be harmful, could be a threat, is just a piece of something floating around or some satellite that's trying to do something weird or freaky. Who knows? So we have a problem. We detect lots of things that we can't track. We don't know their orbits. We can't figure out what they're doing or how they're behaving. So it's tough to regulate something when you don't completely understand what's going on. So all right, so who's involved in this whole business? Well, turns out that you have governments involved, not just the US government, but you have the United Nations. You have governments from all over the globe. They care about this problem. You have NGOs, professional societies. You have universities. You have private industry. So it's a global problem. It's everybody's problem. Because everybody, many people, depend on these services and capabilities from space. But who's responsible? Is it the governments? Well, at some point, governments put stuff up there. But it's not just governments these days. Certainly not professional societies. Academia? Ah, lots of universities are saying, hey, I can put stuff in space. I'm just going to dump a bunch of stuff into orbit. But do they really understand all of these risks, right? Industry, certainly, Boeing's, Lockheed's, tons of companies, they're putting up stuff, they wanna put more stuff, they wanna bring you, right, this information on tap. Human-based activity, all the time, knowing what everybody's doing, what's going on, all this activity. But it's nobody's just single claim, nobody's just gonna strap this on and take this on wholeheartedly. So what's the government's role in all this? For sure, one is to retire the risk, invest in education, right? Make, ma make it such that now you can transition the technology to private industry, regulate and enable. People have said, oh, well, what if these people just self-regulated themselves, right? Well, 
Turns out that the people already on orbit making a lot of money, maybe they don't want Jimmy to be part of that because they want the lion's share. So self-regulation, maybe that's not the answer. Certainly, you want the government to be able to assess and enforce stuff, keep people safe, much like you have people enforcing when people run red lights and that sort of stuff, somehow there's got to be some assessment and some enforcement. What's industry's role? Certainly to get educated about the problem and support education, act responsibly, but we need to determine what is that? What is responsibly? And neighborhood watch. We don't have enough data to see what's going on everywhere all the time. And we need to rely on the citizens of that community to kind of look out for each other as well. So that needs to happen. What's, what's academia's role in all this? Certainly to provide an education, to train people, right? To explore the art of the possible. We should be visionaries, we should be thinking out of the box. It shouldn't just be a couple of people's ideas, it should be everybody's ideas, your ideas. And we need to really develop the science and understanding to make all of those dots that weren't black, black dots, okay? We want to understand what's up there, how it's behaving, be able to predict it, and only after monitoring and understanding all that can we start really understanding what are the next steps to solve that problem. So what can you do? Well, I think a couple things. For sure, I guess I'd like to challenge you to see, you know, when you're at your next party or next coffee break, uh, obviously not here because you've heard this, um, <laughs> but once you like go someplace else, how many people actually know about this issue? How many people know that there's this problem, that there are 22,000 things in space the size of a softball and larger, and all these things are crisscrossing each other, and there's these you know, uh, abilities for things to collide and, and, and disrupt a lot of the service and capabilities that you depend on? Talk to your governments. Uh, you, know, you folks are constituents. People need to hear from you and your voice. And certainly this idea of just getting educated. You know, There's a lot of information on the web, but uh, if you wanted to you know, participate in this stuff, maybe be an astrodynamicist. Uh, I'm not going to give you one of my jackets, but I'd certainly welcome you to the club. <laughs> and uh, I'd love for you to be a part of that. So thank you very much. <laughs>